Yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Erica Hall, co-founder of Mule Design up in San Francisco. Uh, uh, six years ago, I wrote Just Enough Research, the first one. I can't believe it's been six years. That seems like it was like the Cenozoic Age or something like that at this point. I'm like, 2013? That was nine centuries ago, 10 million years ago. And the reason I wrote the book in the first place, and let me tell you, if you have not written a book, it is the, the absolute worst thing you could do with your time. <laughs> uh, no, it's not fun. And the only thing that gave me hope is that uh, my good friend, Mike Kanyovsky, who up until recently worked here at Park, you guys know him? Yeah, he, he's, he was my neighbor when he was working on observing the user experience, which is like that big. And I would only ever see him. I'd invite him to my parties or dinner or say, like, Mike, you want to hang out? And he's like, no, can only walk to cafe, write book, walk home. And that lasted for like a year. And then I said, well, I'm going to write a shorter book about research. <laughs> Turns out writing a shorter book is not necessarily easier. But I was so glad that he kind of cleared the way. Because I'm like, ah, oh, like, it was hard. The reason I wrote it was because I'd say, you know, research is awesome, and it makes your work more fun and more meaningful and all of that. But whenever I'd say, well, what book can I hand a client who is a little itchy about research or hand a new designer, you know, I'd say like, oh, Mike, your book's so awesome. But it doesn't really sell research as a fun, easy thing. Um, and we're good pals. We see our books as really complimentary. Because after mine, I'm like, read mine, then definitely uh, get Mike and Liz's because it's awesome and, and super comprehensive. And I said, OK, I'm so tired of trying to talk clients into doing research. I'm so tired, but there's nothing I can just hand them. So I thought, well, I'll write the shortest possible book with a friendly title. It's orange, so you get like that built-in Dutch audience which is really good for design credibility, <laughs> right? Oh, you laugh. You laugh. Do you know why carrots are orange? Carrots are orange for political reasons to please the Dutch royal family, the House of Orange. Hand to God, this is true. Because you go in a market, if you go like Whole Foods or something, or get Molly Stones, and you see like, oh, fancy carrots in weird colors, like white and purple. Back before the breeding, carrots came in all different colors. And then they said, oh, we want to suck up to the Dutch royal family, so we're going to make carrots orange. Uh -huh. I, I love a good fun fact. That's a real fun one. Um, so my book is, is orange, like carrots are orange, because uh, the Dutch are an important audience. And also because I wanted people to start associating doing research with things that are bright and pleasant and happy and, uh, and all of that. So uh, I, I wrote this book. Uh, people seem to like it. Six years went by, and a couple things happened. Uh, one, people started saying, oh, is this book still relevant? Because it was so many years ago in internet time. And uh, the thing that I'd left out uh, of the first book uh, started to become more and more apparently a problem, and that was surveys. I didn't touch surveys in the first edition of the book because I thought, these are a really advanced research technique. And if I'm going to write this fun little introduction, like everybody can do research, I just can't put surveys in and be responsible. But wow, we are being inundated with the most idiotic surveys. So I said, oh, OK, if I'm going to go back and do a second edition, I should probably provide some guidance. Because otherwise, people are like, oh, I guess surveys aren't even mentioned. So I guess they're not even researched. So I can just do whatever I want. Uh, I, I took this screenshot on the way down on Caltrain. <laughs> I did not go to the next five questions. I just took the screenshot and stopped. I love this. This is going to be my new favorite uh, example. Uh, and there was, a, there was a talk that, uh, that does go with the first edition of the book that's still pretty good. The most uh, famous version of it was the one I did, Dressed Like This, at an event apart. So I, did, I spoke for an event apart uh, several, like, a, a bunch of times. And this is the one they recorded. And so if you go to the event apart Vimeo, you can watch this whole talk. And the great part is they, they mention nothing, because this was at Disney World. 
And I was there, and I'd given this, this my just enough research talk a whole bunch of times. And I was speaking on the third day of the conference, and I'm sitting around, I'm getting kind of like, ah, oh, man, I'm going to give this talk again. How can I make it more fun? Well, I'm at Disney World. Ah, let me check Amazon Prime. Oh, look, I can get a princess dress, a FedEx, so I did. Uh, so you can watch that video. Uh, so I, I won't give like the book talk. I'll just go hit a few concepts. That's why I said just enough research. Or we're not going to have enough time. Uh, I'll just talk about a few of the concepts that are, I think, uh, particularly important to me or I, I just really want to draw attention to. So because research is about questions, I'll start with a question for all of you. And I want you to look in your heart and I want you to answer this question honestly, candidly. Do you enjoy being right? If you like having the right answer, raise your hand. Raise your hand. OK, I don't want to see any lying liars there. OK, great, all honest. Um, great, there, I've given you a right answer. So you can have that super good feeling. Because uh, I'll tell you something about me. I love being right. Love it. I love it so much. Like Sometimes people tweet at me like, oh, Erica, you're so right about that. And I just like screenshot this. I love it. I love it. And because I was that kid, right, in elementary school who was like, call on me, call on me. I want to be so right. I'm like fact checking my friend's jokes and stuff like that. Yeah, I was a real party. I, I, I never got beat up on the playground. Uh, so then, then I went to college, and, um, you know, cause, so since I'm mercenary, right, I studied philosophy. Uh, because philosophy is the study of how to be right. I like majored in being right because it's all about uh, defining your terms and winning argument. So I was like, sweet, I love this. This is so good. I get to like really hone my skills uh, being right. And then I went into the real world and I learned that this desire to be right, holding on to like wanting to prove how right I was had a few negative effects. Um, one, it made me super annoying. <laughs> um, uh, two, it made me a really, really bad listener. And you've probably encountered this person, like you start to ask a question and they jump in before you're even done to prove that they're psychic or something. Um, uh, so that was, that was kind of me, like, wait, no, you don't even have to stop talking. And I can get in there, I can answer your question. And because of that, it increased the chance that I was actually wrong. And this is something I learned over time, that wanting to prove how right I was made it more likely that I was not going to be right and that I was going to be wrong. So with the help of various colleagues and friends over time, I came to find the error in my ways. Uh, but this is true, I think, for most of us at some level. And I've talked to a lot of people about this. And it's just true that in school, when we're, when we're growing up and going to school, and this is pretty much true in every, every country where I've talked to people about this, uh, kids aren't rewarded for asking questions. We're rewarded for having an answer and having the right answer. And it's inculcated in us that there is a right answer. And if you have it, you're rewarded. But if you question, if you question the teacher, if you question your manager, if you question like, why do we do things like this? We are not rewarded for that. And so of course, having an answer, having a right answer, having an answer that has been deemed correct, that is a very good feeling. That certainty is, is very comforting. And we have probably also, we probably get like flooded with like, I don't know, whatever neurotransmitter, like you have a right answer and probably your brain like lights up like dopamine, oxytocin, I don't know. Something, something junk neuroscience. Uh, but, but this is why, pe this is why there's so much resistance to doing research. Like people come up with all these objections. But the truth is that we really, really want to be right and we don't want to be uncertain and we don't want to be wrong because that's terrifying because we have never in our lives been rewarded for asking questions, we've always been rewarded for having the right answer or having the appearance of the right answer and being able to like sell somebody that we have the right answer. 
Uh, but the, the truth that I found is as I got in, into, uh, you know, I've been a design consultant for, uh, I just say the 21st century now, because that way I don't have to count. Uh, the truth is that a question is so much more powerful than an answer. Because if you have a good question, you can use that same question over and over and over again. You can like never stop asking that question. But if you have an answer, an answer has a really short shelf life. And this is true in something like design. Say you're designing something for, I don't know, high school students, uh, study aids for high school students. If you have a question like, oh, how do high school students spend their time? Or what apps do high school students use the most? If you have those questions, you could ask those questions over and over and over again, different times of the year, different parts of the country, different parts of the world, different socioeconomic groups, whatever, and you could keep learning. But if you asked that question and then said, okay, we're done asking that question, we have an answer, and you hang on to that answer, you're gonna start being wrong really quickly. And if your mindset is, no, we have to defend the answer we found, instead of, oh, let's keep asking our question, you're introducing a lot of risk. But a lot of people don't see it this way. They see like, oh, we want certainty, we want the answer. You know, if, if I've talked to so many clients where we come in, we start a project, and we say, okay, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna do some research, and they said, oh, we did that two years ago. <laughs> I'm like, how, how nice for you. <laughs> right, we're gonna do some now. <laughs> uh, but there's a sense of like, oh, when can, when can the pain of not having the right answer stop? Okay, we have a, we have a, a report. The pain will stop because we have a report. Because when you're sitting at your keyboard, and it doesn't matter what role you have, if you're you know, a designer, an engineer, a writer, you're there, every word goes where you want it to go, every pixel goes where you want it to go, you know, more or less, and you're like, ah, oh, I have so much control over what I'm doing. But when you send that out into the world, you don't actually have any control. Like it's a big world and it's always changing. And if you think like, oh, I just, I just wanna have certainty and I just wanna have control, that's a, not a good place to be in if you want to create things that succeed in the world or perhaps change the world for the better. Uh, because unlike in philosophy where you can define your terms and create your airtight little argument about monads or whatever, um, you can't establish terms, you can just make assumptions. And every time you make an unfounded assumption, you're introducing risk. And risk means that you know, you've wasted all of your time because you were really wrong because you were worried about defending your right answer instead of finding out the right answer. It's not bad to be right. Being right is good, but it's very different to want to always be finding the right answer as opposed to having the right answer inside you. And so often, this is how people talk about design. They're like, oh, the, if you're really a good like genius designer, you don't have to do research because you magically have answers in your spleen or something. I don't know, I don't know. Um, so uh, my good buddy Voltaire, Right, had this really, I think, really, really apt quote that uncertainty is uncomfortable. It really is. I'm not, I'm not saying that ha not having that answer is a great feeling. It's a terrible feeling. And that's why people want to hang on to that good feeling. That's why you're all like, yes, I like being right. That is a really good feeling. Uncertainty is a really uncomfortable feeling. But like, certainty is absurd. So, so this is, I think, a really, really true thing in design and technology is that like, wanting to hang on to that feeling of certainty is a really absurd thing to do. The better thing is to say, okay, being uncertain is really uncomfortable. Not having that answer inside you, not knowing that you have like an A plus answer inside you is a really painful, uncomfortable feeling that you wanna stop as soon as possible, but you have to learn to live with that feeling if you wanna do things well and ultimately arrive at the right answer. And the good news is, uh, and the, the reason I, I wrote the book and revised the book is that you really can start wherever you are. And I think this is another one of the reasons why uh, people resist um, 
doing research is a sense of like, oh, there's one, there's a right way to do it. Uh, there's the proper way, there's the more academic way. But it really is like, if you just switch your mindset to asking questions is more useful than trying to hang on to and defend an answer, that right there is a research mindset. Um, and, uh, and the more that you can start to develop that as a practice, the better off you'll be. Um, and so, so what makes me uh, so interested is I think about why people are so resistant to research and, and why there's bad design in the world, right? This goes back to like being in a place that's sort of weird and things aren't really totally working right and you're kind of frustrated and that's a real moment to think, well, why are things this way? Like, why does bad design exist in the world? Like, we know how to do good design, so why is there so much bad design? Because we have so much knowledge at this point, and yet things are kind of not perfect. Um, and when I say bad design, it's like, it's design that fails to fulfill its purpose, or doesn't meet a need, or it's just harder to use. Um, and, uh, and I was looking for examples. This is our um, the newspaper website. It's just like total garbage right now for a lot of reasons. Uh, but uh, yeah, I've worked on a lot of publications, and designing an article page is one of the like that's one of the basic you know content types when you're just talking about simple simple websites. But the thing I want to point out to you about this is that that's the content on the whole page. That's that's it. It's the exact same thing as the title. That's, that's it for content on the page. And I look at this and I'm like, how did that happen? Why does that exist? That's really interesting to me when I see something like that. I'm like, ha, huh, imagine the meeting. You know, I always imagine the meeting. And, uh, and then of course, there's what I call the Jared Spool commemorative example. <laughs> um, this, the United States was like this for a really, really long time. And I would think, there have got to be so many like smart, competent people at United. Like, how did they end up with this? And then it slowly got better over time. Uh, this was like the design thinking version. Like, they all took their post-its a little bit too literally. <laughs> right? They were all like locked in some airless conference room with post-its for a long time. And they're like, oh, just let's just do that. Let's just do that. And then finally, after a decade, I've been tracking this thing, finally they got to a point of what do people want to do? They wanted, this is what it's like now, and it's like, oh, wow, that took a while, that took a while. <laughs> and, um, and it's easy to say, okay, well, you know, United, it's an airline, it's not a design-oriented company. Some companies just have good design in their DNA. <laughs> Some companies are just really, they're just, they have strong design values. Um, I love this quote. I used this slide in Japan once and I had to like explain to the interpreter like what a toxic hell stew was, it was great. Um, and you're like, how did Apple do this? How does Apple, who's so good at uh, designing so many like, products, how, like how did they do this? It seems sort of impossible. And then you think, um, oh, well if you just do design well, then your business is gonna automatically succeed. Virgin America was really good at the whole customer experience. Yeah, a little I'll pour some out for them. That makes me very sad. Uh, they don't exist anymore. Because it didn't matter how good the design was, how good the customer experience was, if those, that set of decisions didn't really connect to the fundamentals of their business, right? If they, like they knew from day one that this beautiful site, it was a pleasure to use, you could order food from your seat, everything was so well designed, but that doesn't matter because the economics of the American airline industry are such that uh, the impact of customer experience is negligible, everybody just chooses flights based on routes and price and stuff like that. And then the other kind of bad design are the things where you, you look at it and you're like, why does that exist? Yeah, contemplate this. It takes a second. It takes a good 30 seconds to sink in. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Video bills. So when you're done watching everything on Time Warner Cable, 
You can watch your bill. <laughs> He's so happy. Lewis is so happy watching his bill. It's personalized for him. And you think like, okay, this looks like the production values are pretty good. That tech, it, this took some doing to like spontaneously generate. And they have little soundtracks and things. And then you think, why didn't they just either simplify the information or like really acknowledge it. Like my stuff's on auto pay. I haven't seen a Comcast bill in like nine years. Uh, they're probably charging me $800 a month for sure. And then, do you know what this is? Yeah, that's beautiful. So beautiful, so shiny. Ooh, that looks like an Apple product. Uh, the $400 juice machine that didn't squeeze bags of frozen fruit as fast as a human could. I, I just, I watch this when I'm stressed out. It really calms me down. <laughs> so squeeze, squeeze. Like this got like $140 million in venture. Yeah, yeah, there's some opportunity cost right there. Um, and now, you know, I wrote this book, uh, Conversational Design, uh, because uh, interfaces should be conversational, but not in the way that uh, people really uh, talk about it. I have a special bone to pick. Bank of America is my business bank. Um, yeah, no, no, not, not, do not tap on Erica. Do not tap on Erica. Uh, and, uh, and so this is annoying because it has my name and I've been seeing all these ads for things with my name, like not spelled right, but that's still my name. But it doesn't even do anything. Like I tried, I said, Leo, and uh, I took this screenshot from their demo where you ask it a question, you ask it a really specific question and it's like, I could take you to the homepage. <laughs> right, right. And so the, the reason I show all of these examples when I'm talking to you about how people should do research and ask questions is to go back to the question, why is it, so hard to do, because you look at each of these and I bet you could come up with a better design for it. And people do this sometimes when designs launch and some designers like to completely redesign, like that's dumb, I could totally do it. But bad design gets out in the world, not because we don't know how to do good design, but because people want to be right. Because a good idea starts out over here and then it gets processed through everybody's insecurities and fears and constraints, blah, 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 and then out the other end, you get a juicero, right? <laughs> or you get a video bill, or you get iTunes, even though there is a better way to design it, but you get people who are in a room and people don't wanna ask, people don't wanna question, like, is that really the best thing we should do? Uh, does the target audience really need that? Like, how many of you, do you remember 3D TVs? Yeah, that was gonna be a thing because Avatar did well at the box office. They didn't do any in-home testing with it, right? Some early adopters bought it. My lawyer bought one and had us over and he's like, check it out, put on. I'm like, I'm not gonna wear the stupid goggles in your living room. And it turns out that people might go to a 3D movie like Avatar but people aren't gonna sit around their living rooms wearing glasses or doing that. But they didn't do any research until after they'd launched it. Um, and that's why 3D TVs don't exist anymore. And so people wanting to be right is the biggest impediment to good design. So everybody just has to get over themselves and get over that fear and get over that terror. And I can tell you from um, doing so, so many years of design consulting, every organization, every size, the common thread is people are terrified of each other. People are terrified of being like truly honest with each other, like all that like candid, the radical candor stuff aside. Um, people are really afraid of looking like they don't have an answer. And so they'll just kind of let something go along and they'll be like, oh, I don't, I guess everybody else knows that that's the right thing to do and nobody wants to reveal their ignorance because um, that's terrifying. And that's why bad design gets out in the world. And so overcoming that and creating a culture where it is safe and okay to be uncertain and ask questions is the best, fastest way to get good design out there. 
I mean, it's terrifying. Being uncertain is really, really super terrifying. Um, but like, life is messy. Life is super, that Caltrain I was on today was super messy. <laughs> but I got here, and I got here for like, what, eight bucks or something? Faster than it would have driven. Messy. Um, and, but everybody wants things to be tidy. Like, I love this diagram because there are all these like, different types of, of ways of thinking about and, and conceptualizing, like measuring and communicating about things. And somebody's like, yes, I will put it in hexagons that don't touch. <laughs> this diagram was created by somebody who, as a child, did not have their food touch on the plate. Uh, and so people optimize for things being tidy, not for being bright or being useful. It's like I need it to be controlled, and I need it to feel certain, and I need it to feel like everything's in its place. And that's why things are kind of terrible. Uh, and I talk about research and collaboration together a lot, because you have to have both. You can't have one without the other. Because so you think about like what is design, right? Oh my god, I know if you're on design Twitter, you're like, no, please, no, I've got PTSD from that conversation. All design is, is getting from the current state, what things are like now, to some desired future state that's better, you know, for whatever value of better. It's just getting from here to there and doing that in a systematic way. A design project is a series of decisions. Like, even to this day, people are still really focused on artifacts, but the artifacts just exist to enable the decisions. And uh, so what research does is it leads to evidence-based decisions. Like, I like talking about evidence-based design now instead of talking about research because it should be part of one process. Like you shouldn't have to argue for getting the information you need to design. And as long as you talk about research separately, people want to carve it out because that's like design is making artifacts and things like that are tangible and feel good and research is asking questions, which is very uncomfortable. Research is admitting you don't have the answers, which is very uncomfortable. Um, to make evidence-based decisions, you need collaboration. Because if just one person has the evidence, right, and you put that person in a room with decision makers, the person with the most power is going to win and you're gonna end up with a juicero. That's the threat now. Research, collaborate, or juicero. <laughs> Squeeze. Squeeze. Uh, and collaboration, right, collaboration is so hard that there have never been any real pictures taken of it. That's why you see all the stock photos that look like this. Like, multi-ethnic people touching hands. Because it's like, have you, have you seen people collaborate? No, I guess it looks like that. You could work next to somebody for a decade and never truly collaborate with them. Because collaboration means working together towards a shared goal. Ah. Uh, I, you know, and so often people might be working in the same room, but they don't have shared goals because they never stop to say, oh, do we know what our goals are? Do we have all the information to meet those goals? Do we know what our roles are vis-a-vis -vis each other to achieve those goals? Um, and so collaboration, like design, is hard for people reasons. I love this photo. I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to see here, but it looks like she's about ready to just like pull that dude's chair, just like pull him right back. <laughs> Get out of my way, try to collaborate. Um, and collaboration is again hard because we're human and we do human things, we have organizations made up of humans. And, you know, ego, somebody wants to get credit for having the right idea. Uh, that's often blamed for a lack of collaboration. But usually that happens because the incentives are bad. Like I've worked with so many organizations in which they say like, oh, we want a really collaborative team, but they do like stack ranking or they reward the person who had the idea and so the meetings are super cutthroat. Um, people are in silos from each other, like the disciplines don't collaborate or people are, are in different places. Um, there's competition for resources. I, I've seen teams where it's like, oh, we've got one UX writer we share or we have like, oh, we've got one researcher or we like, we can only do one study a quarter, yeah. and people are really, really in competition, or people are far apart either because they work remotely or they have different goals or different models of the work and nobody's facilitating that process. People don't collaborate naturally without facilitation. 
And uh, the thing I'm, I'm starting to argue for now is uh, companies have really, really grown internal design teams a lot in the past, like 15 years, uh, which is fantastic. But the thing that they're missing is that sort of strategist role that cuts across every discipline. And that's what you got like back when, um, when so many organizations worked with strategic design agencies. And they'd say, oh, the agency would come in and they'd have that role about like, okay, I'm gonna look across marketing, I'm gonna look across product, I'm gonna look across engineering and have a unified strategy. And I think that's the thing that's lost the most with people bringing design in-house. Uh, and I think that could be a role that people could cultivate in-house, but it takes doing it explicitly. And then of course, uh, being a delivery-driven organization. Like, oh, we're just going so fast, we don't have time to stop and think. And, and we're just gotta make stuff fast. Uh, and of course, academic research is not. It's not collaborative. A lot of times there's a, there's a lot of fights for resources, fights for, for credit and things like that. And so if you just take somebody, like this happens in a lot of organizations where they will, they'll say, we have a real commitment to research, so we're going to hire really, really good people. Like they have PhDs, they're really smart, they have great ideas, and we're gonna like put them in a building over here. Like I've, I've talked to, I think I talked to some people at IBM where they were like, oh yeah, research is just in a whole separate building. So you've got the people making the decisions, right? Design is a series of decisions. And then you've got like really smart people in a building with a separate HVAC system who occasionally generates a report for the designers to ignore. <laughs> it's true. So you can't, if you don't have collaboration, it doesn't, you can't just hire a bunch of researchers or expect to do research if you haven't already established a collaborative background because then there's just gonna be fighting. You're just gonna be like, oh, cage match. I wanna prove I'm more right. Like nobody wants somebody to tell them what to do, right? So if you're not collaborative, it's gonna feel like that when you bring findings. It doesn't matter how good the findings are. Uh, so collaboration, to do this thing, to actually work together towards a shared goal, takes intent and incentives. Like there has to be a reason for people to do it. And I'll, uh, one of the excuses to not collaborate is like, oh, it's just gonna be designed by consensus. It's just gonna be groupthink. And, um, and this is uh, something I talked to Dan Brown about a lot, the um, information architect from Eight Shapes, not the guy who wrote Da Vinci Code. Uh, that groupthink happens when a team optimizes for the appearance of agreement to avoid dealing with a shared fear of confrontation. It's fear again. You've gotta overcome fear to have these things. Um, conflict is a part of collaboration because good collaboration happens when you've got people representing um, <clears throat> different sets of values but all working towards a shared goal, right? You're like, okay, we've all agreed we want to get here. Like the engineer is going to argue for performance. The this designer is going to argue for some sort of elegance. Maybe the researcher is going to argue on behalf of the user. Maybe the business argues on behalf of profitability. You've got like a business strategist in there. If you get all those people in a room kind of arguing, but towards the shared goal, you'll get a much stronger solution than if everybody just quietly goes, yeah, I think that's fine. Yeah. Are we not fighting? Okay, we must be collaborating because we're not fighting. But that's not how it works. Um, this is Dan Brown's book. I know I'm supposed to talk about my book, but this is a really important book because this is about collaboration, which is something that you have to have in order to do research in your organization. It doesn't matter how many good, great individual researchers and designers you have. If you don't have collaboration, you're gonna lose all that value. Um, and so uh, he talks about like the fact you've gotta have a plan, have a rationale, have roles and responsibilities, expectations, communicate progress, reflect on performance. The exact same behaviors that support collaboration are the exact same things you've got to do to have research. So they, they really, really go together. Um, and so, uh, so research, you know, how research helps is it, maybe it's sort of an obvious thing, but a, an important thing to, to understand about doing research and going back to collaboration is data alone doesn't change minds. I can't tell you how many times somebody's contacted me and said, hey, can you come in and run this study because I want to prove the value of research to the decision makers or to the stakeholders. And I'm like, no, I can't do that. That's impossible. 
Because if people don't already believe in the methods, if people don't already believe in the sources of information, data that comes from that source isn't going to change their minds. And all of social science bears this out, right? If somebody has a belief and you bring them data that contradicts that belief, that will make them dig into their original belief harder. Human brains, <laughs> dumb, 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 dumb. And like the saddest story I heard about this, I was at the Berkeley High School a few years ago and I was on a panel with a bunch of researchers and there was one researcher there <clears throat> who was like a big technology company uh, person, right? They really liked working in a large organization and, and running a team and like working on these really big, uh, you know, interesting projects in this, this whole giant system. And they told a story about how they, at, at their last job, uh, was looking at the product roadmap with like the VP of product and saw that some of the assumptions were wrong and their research totally supported, like it was totally relevant and totally supported some changes in the product roadmap. And so this researcher made a meeting with the VP, went back, went over all their data, made sure everything was lined up, spent the whole weekend working on a presentation, came in Monday morning and found out the VP had canceled the meeting. <laughs> you feel the pain? And because uh, that VP didn't want to be told he was wrong. So it didn't matter how good the researcher's data was because they didn't already have that relationship with the decision maker. So it doesn't, you can't just have really, really good data and change minds with it. You have to already have that relationship and that collaboration and then bring new information into it. And this can be super painful for researchers who are like, oh my God, but my data is right. Like what else can I do? I, I'm not a, I don't want to be in sales. That feels gross. Well, you're in sales. We're all in sales. <clears throat> it's cool. It's about understanding like good salespeople are great. They, they help the customer focus on things. Um, and so, so we hear like these are the most stereotypical uh, objections to research, right? We don't have time. We have time to make a thing, but we don't have time to know if we're making the right thing or not. Like, let's make a wrong thing really fast. We don't have money. We have money to burn. Chusera. Uh, we don't have expertise. Like, we have the expertise to like make the thing, but not to know if we're making the right thing. Uh, we've got specialists. Again, we have the special research pen over here in the other building. Like, they make reports for us to ignore. Uh, we've got analytics. This one's super popular. I'm hearing this now. Like, oh, we're just using um, marketing metrics to like understand our uh, our customer. We don't have to talk to them because talking to people is terrifying. Let's make a prototype. That's a popular one. Um, and to this day, I still hear billionaire geniuses who changed the world and were responsible for iTunes um, didn't do research. So as an aspiring billionaire genius, I don't have to do research either. Um, so have any of you heard like run up against things that I didn't mention here? Like objections? These are, these are the popular ones. No time, no money. Lies. When you hear that, when you hear somebody say, oh, we don't have blah to do research, what that means is I'm terrified and I don't want to reveal that I don't actually know what I'm doing. Every single time. Every single time. But, um, you know, if you do this stuff, right, you, you're, everything goes faster. Like, solving design problems moves at the speed of decision making. And if you're in a room arguing about people's personal opinions without evidence to base those decisions on, that's the slowest way of working at all, right? It lowers risk, saves money, increases value. Everything's great. Everybody's happy, happy, more effective, more efficient. And, and a lot of times when people talk about design research, they, they define it as user research. And this is what's going on with like design ops. It's, we're opsing everything right now design ops, and they say, oh, it's operationalizing user research. But you can't just focus on the user, right? Because you've got your users, customers, whatever, you've got your organization, and you've got the world that you, those two groups of people encounter each other. 
What this really means is you need to understand, you need to do research, you need to understand the needs and behaviors of people out in the world. Um, you need to understand your own internal goals, assumptions, and resources. If you don't know this, you can't solve design problems in your organizational context. And there's the whole world of things you don't control, like the competition and you know, the weather and the economy. And like I said, the world's messy and you can't control those things, but you can understand them. You can try to understand them, because if you just pretend they don't exist, that's creating a huge amount of risk. And, uh, and so what happens if you don't go through this process, right? You've got everybody in your team with their own individual personal view of the problem you're trying to solve. But you have to make things explicit and raise those questions on your team to say, what's our goal? What are our priorities? What are the risks? What are the constraints? What do our users and customers really need? What are our internal capabilities? What's the competition doing? If you ask all those questions together with your team, then you end up working in a shared reality, which you really should be doing if you're solving complex problems. It doesn't help if you've got one person on a team solving a problem and, oh, that person has all the knowledge in their head. That person has the evidence. That doesn't help. You all have to be operating in this shared reality. And going through the research process together, asking and answering questions together is the best way to, to all be operating in that reality, solving this problem. And you have to start from a place of agreement, right? You can't argue somebody. Like I said, data doesn't change minds. You can't change minds by arguing with anybody and, oh, it's getting up to Thanksgiving, so everybody's going to be running that experiment in their homes. No, I'm totally going to fight with my uncle and I'm totally going to change his mind this year. No, you have a much better chance of changing people's minds by asking questions about things that are personally meaningful to them. And you've got a much better chance of creating the space to do research if you start from a point of agreement. And the best point of agreement I've found is that everybody wants to design better products and services faster. Like, start there. Don't try to talk anybody into doing research. You start there. And people are like, do you want to design better products and services faster? Most people will say yes. And if they don't, you're working in a really weird place. And the other thing that's true is um, we want to do bad things slowly. Uh, United Airlines. Uh, <laughs> and nobody wants to read a report. Like even researchers don't want to read like long, boring research reports, right? So what you need to do with design research is figure out what you need to know in order to work together to meet your goals, you know, making the best use of everybody's time and, and energy. It's just making sure that you're making the best possible decisions. And when we're talking about applied research in the world, in industry, not in academia, that's the standard, right? You don't need to worry about an academic standard because success is not publishing in a peer-reviewed journal. Success is making better products faster because you're making better design decisions. And so when you hold that as the standard, right, a lot of the pain and confusion around um, doing research well comes from not having agreed explicitly, which you have to do to collaborate, right? Everybody has to have explicit agreement about um, what you're all there to do and who's, who's doing what. Um, once you have that explicit standard, you know what to optimize for. You know what good research is. There's no like gold standard, right? That's why I hate the term guerrilla research, because that implies that there's like doing it the right way, doing it the expensive way, and that's already a huge, huge bias for people. Um, and so the most important part of, uh, and the most neglected part is, is the forming the questions. This is the part where there's the most confusion. Uh, even when organizations want to do research well and believe in the concept of research in order to, to do design, uh, everybody focuses on like, oh, what's the best method? What's the best like, output? Like, how shiny should our report be? And they totally blow off the forming questions part. But if you don't have a good question, you can never get a useful, useful answer. Um, uh, this is a little, like I made a tidy diagram in my book. <laughs> yeah, so that's what designers want to do. It's like, oh, we want to put, we'll put all the things in a tidy little diagram. Um, 
uh, Deverly's design office is, is a group of really smart people, and they came up with this. They're like, oh, we're going to think about research and different types of research. And it's like it's so easy to, to sort of be four levels of abstraction up and think about what's important about research. It's like, oh, it's, we've, it's in these, this tidy conceptual box. Uh, but I think when you're thinking about like what should we optimize for in research, you should be goal driven, like no research without a goal, because then you won't know when you're done. You won't know if you've you won't know if you're if you've succeeded. Like I talked to a lot of people who say, well, we tried research last year, we tried talking to customers last year, and nothing really came of it, so it seemed like a giant waste of time. I said, Well, did you explicitly in advance determine what your goals and priorities were? and what you needed to know in order to have a better chance of meeting those goals. And they were like, no, we just talked to some people. And I'm like, there. If you don't have a goal, you don't know what research you need to do. And you also need a skeptical mindset, which means you need to question the value of any approach. You need to say, oh, is this the right way to answer this question at this time? And you need to, again, question your own processes. And it can be really quick. Like the objection is always like, oh, if we open it back up, it will take so much time. We can't open it back up. We're already sunk cost fallacy all the way. Um, but it's a lot more expensive and time consuming to do the wrong thing just because you're afraid of asking the question, right? Just because it's terrifying to say, is this really the best way to, to do this right now? Um, but if you can like, be strong and have that inside, then you'll be a lot more effective. So research is really, really simple, right? All you do is you form questions, gather data, answer the questions, analyze data. If you do these three steps, you're doing research. If you skip any one of them, you're not. Like so many people go straight to gather data or they form questions and gather data and then just immediately like, oh, we talked to one customer, I know what to build. It happens all the time. But you've got to do all three and you can take a day or you can take a year to go through a research project, right? There's no correct length, but you have to do each one of these things. You have to have clear objectives, and then it, like gather your data and then look to see what it means. And then what comes out of it, insights that feed into your decisions and hopefully you're more successful. Because this is the other uh, like kind of objection you get is like, oh, we don't want research to tell us what to do. And I'm like, oh, sweetie, <laughs> sweetie, that's not how it works. You're gonna learn something and you're still gonna have to do the work. Like I did a workshop for this. It was a really, really great company that did software in the construction industry. And uh, I did this whole like really intensive two-day workshop with them. And the way that they decided what features to build is they got a lot of plumbers in the room and did dot voting prioritization. And I'm like, you can't do that. Like these, these guys, that's not their milieu, is they don't dot vote on which size pipe to use. Like all you did was learn how good plumbers were at dot voting. You didn't actually learn anything about them, but they were doing that because they didn't want to take responsibility for their own decisions. They wanted to say, well, all the plumbers put like all of their little stickies on you know, the invoicing feature. Instead of really thinking, well, what do we need to build that best uh, supports our business and meets the customer need? And all research activities are, are ways to answer questions. Right? There's no one way is necessarily better than another way. Uh, it all depends on what your questions are, and it all depends on what the purpose is. Right? Your data isn't meaningful un unless you ask a really good question. So I'll talk about research questions uh, really quick, and then you can ask me questions. Um, so uh, this is my very, very, very favorite quote uh, about research and business. All business is about making bets on human behavior. And this is a good one to trot out if you're dealing with like a business person who's like, eh, research, blah, 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 because it's from the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> Work with biases. Work with biases. <laughs> uh, seriously, people make their lives so much harder because they, they want this like, oh, but I will win. I will be right. It's like, you know what? Like, do the thing that gets you to the right answer. Do the thing that builds the product that actually serves the customer. Don't try to win the argument. If you win, if you try to win the argument, all of your energy is going to be in like trying to prove you're right. Um, but when you use this framing, this takes certainty off the table, right? 
You can never be certain. We just want to place an informed bet. We don't just want to set fire to a pile of money. It's like, do you want to set fire to a big pile of money today, or do you maybe want to like think about it for 10 minutes and then place a more informed bet? Um, so you need goals before you can form questions. And there are good questions and bad questions, right? A good research question is specific, it's actionable and practical, right? You know what you're finding out, it's within your means to do it, and once you form the question, you have a pretty good sense of, okay, these are the things we have got to do to answer the question. This is my favorite bad question. I'm hoping that we're almost done with this. Um, because uh, millennials aren't really a thing. Liking isn't really a thing. Um, we're all sick of this word. Uh, but I love search like Google Business News for millennial. It's still funny. But now it's probably all polluted with OK Boomer stuff. So a good question, a good research question would be something like if you were trying to figure out how to like make money off of the fact that people graduate from college and don't know how to cook, you could say, oh, how do recent college graduates decide what to have for dinner? Uh, like, based on this question, uh, I bet all of you could, uh, could figure out how to get an answer with some degree of confidence in, you know, in a pretty short amount of time because it's a good question. And the, a great question is to stop and get together with your team and say, what do we really know? This is the question that people don't ask, that you can, that's terrifying to ask, to say, okay, what do we know, and what are we just assuming? Just take the time to ask this one, and, it, and you could probably figure it out within an hour, but you probably, people won't like what you find out or figure out, which is, oh shoot, we were just like hoping that was true. Um, and the best question is the thing you don't know that carries the most risk. Because the question I get a lot is, okay, just enough research, fine, whatever, but where do we start? Because there's like infinity questions we could ask. And it's like, figure out where your risk is. If you don't know where your risk is, again, maybe that's the question you should start with. And big risks are, you know, your customers don't value what you're making, your best customers, the people who could potentially generate the most revenue for you actually need something other than what you're making. Your business model doesn't support it. Um, you can't build it. Uh, boy, we've, we've gone down the road and then found that out too late. Someone else is doing it better, and better is in the eyes of your customer, not like, oh, nobody's making a better juice bag squeezer than we are. And succeeding will destroy the earth or have some other bad effect, right? These are the places to start. It's like list out your big risks, and that will tell you where you need to do your research to decrease your risk and increase your chance of success because it's all about placing bets. And what you need to know and what you can learn by asking directly are often different. Like this is, an, this is a place where people get really confused. We're like, oh, but my research questions are just what I'm gonna ask people, right? Right, we worked on a project with um, a tourism office and they wanted to know how people spent money on vacation. I'm like, the best way to get lied to is to say, how do you budget for vacation? And they'd start talking about like, oh, well clearly we you know, start saving months in advance instead of like, we were driving down the road and saw a cool sign and spent all our money, woo! You know? uh, that might be your research question, but then what you say to the human you're interviewing is walk me through your last vacation and the spending you know, will emerge because they won't be all like tense and performative. How likely are people to adopt my product in the next six months? Oh, this is like the worst market research question. How likely are you to do a thing? No one can answer that question. Nobody can predict their own behavior. But you can say, oh, tell me what you use, right? Um, or maybe you don't even need to interview people. Maybe there's a better way to answer that question. So it is 8.33. I could talk for another nine hours. Uh, but, uh, I actually do have a train to catch, but hey, <laughs> who has questions or wants to fight? Um, I loved your example about the plumbers dot voting and it struck me that I've been at companies that do something similar but they use surveys. So they send surveys to their users and they're like, which 
which would you like? And it's basically features, and then they mm -hmm. use that to figure out what features yeah. to build. Can you talk about whether like doing it with a survey is better than having a few people in a room dot voting, or what would you do instead? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, surveys, surveys, surveys. Da, 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 da. Um, no. Yeah, some, uh, somebody on, on Twitter posted that. It's, I, I put it in the book because that was so awesome. No, people can't rank features. Um, surveys seem more objective because you can count um, the lies. <laughs> It's true. People are really uh, good at making up answers. And nobody, like the work of prioritizing features or designing a product, that's what designers get paid to do. But everybody runs surveys because they want to be off the hook. Um, but nobody can answer a question. Like, sure, they'll say something that sounds good. They're like, I'll totally use that feature. Like, so many um, businesses have totally wasted money because they, they ran a survey. And they ask, like, how likely are you to do this? Oh, which of these features sounds the best to you? And they're not actually asking about, like, you predict the future by knowing what people do now, what they've done, and why. You can't necessarily ask people why, but you need to have a really good sense of, of, of what people are doing and why. And you can't get that through a survey. What you can get through a survey is any question that the person can answer Truthfully. Um, so factual things, like a, a good survey question is, how many kids under the age of 18 live in your home with you? I hope people can answer that question. Like maybe the noise in the closet is the child that lives in the walls, but, uh, but you probably know how many kids. You know? And so and it also has to be something they're willing to answer. So if you ask somebody a question about something that's very sensitive, it's like, are they gonna give me the right answer? Are they gonna inflate? Like, can I ask people their income? Will they like honestly report their income? Um, so those are the kind of things that you can ask in a survey. But you can't like, yeah, people do feature ranking. The same company also they had they showed me this really complicated survey they ran to have like rank features. Like there was just over the weekend LinkedIn. Like Peter Merholtz um, uh, tweeted out a survey he got on LinkedIn that was this like Likert scale extravaganza, whereas like rate how logic the survey results were on one to 10. No human has feelings in 10 degrees of granularity, right? Like they could have they said like, numbers. They give numbers and then they yeah, yeah, that's another one. But even like they could have said, uh, did you think the survey results were in an order that made sense? Yes or no? Like that would have been a great question to ask. And people said, oh yeah, made sense, didn't make sense. Why did they need to do the ten, the one to ten thing, right? Like I see these all all the time. Like if you start looking for these, this is some hot garbage, right? And like this is really what sent me down the path of wanting to include surveys because this company makes a lot of money. You see these, everybody uses these, and they are complete garbage. And so it's like my mission to get people to not do this because you look like. Rate how well the site's organized. Rate the options for navigating the site. And my favorite, the question that tells you that this is a uh, hot garbage. Rate the number of clicks. <laughs> it was an excellent number of clicks. <laughs> number of clicks I've ever seen on a website. No. People are going to read that and click, oh, it's only one click. I found one in here right away. Excellent. Excellent number of clicks. Where you're like, eh, it was a five or a six. It was not the best number of clicks I've seen. Yeah. Garbage. Garbage. So, I'm sorry. You, there's, I hope I answered your question somewhere in that. <laughs> Yeah. 
Uh, That's a, it's good because the other way to get people to remember things is traumatize them. So I chose that option. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask your opinion of a, a related situation. Mm -hmm. I was once at a customer meeting with a product manager, and he was going to take some customers to lunch. And he was going to ask them, do you want A, B, or C? And I didn't go to lunch with him because I thought that he should ask them, what is the biggest problem you have that we're mm -hmm. not solving? Yeah. And additionally, like, yeah, never ask people what features they want. But also, and this, I, I get in this situation a lot where um, the, the salespeople are gathering information from the customer. And that's already a bias, a palooza. And this happens a lot. Like, I've worked with a, a lot, a lot of foundations and uh, mission-driven organizations. And the people who hold the relationship with, like, the major donors absolutely don't want to, like, let some, like, wacky designer go wild on that relationship. But you have to because you need the honest answer. And you need the not getting wined and dined answer. Like, incentives are really important. You want to give incentives to people for their time. But if you're there sitting around the table, like, oh, best customers, having a good lunch, like, you can definitely, like, salespeople, good salespeople know how to tease out what their customers really need. Uh, but that's different from starting with your question, right? Because you really want to say, what do we really want to know, and what's the best way to find it out? And maybe the best way to find it out is, like, oh, they're having lunch with the salespeople. Maybe we can find this out. Maybe that is the best place to find that out. But you have to start with what you need to know and then say, well, what's the best way to find out what we need to know? Maybe it is a survey. Maybe it is lunch with the sales team. But so often people start from the activity they're already doing that's comfortable. People start with what's most comfortable um, instead of like, what, what do we need to know? What's the best way to find it out? Hi, I'm gonna follow up with that. Um, in terms of if you have PMs are asking you questions about attitudes and like their likes and how would you turn that into more of a research method instead of so I've been told that oh if you want to do any editorial uh, studies that it needs to be very large scale and more quantitative kind of similar to the survey you were just showing about what features would you like so I was just wondering in terms of have you come across that and how do you solve like getting an, something attitudinal or? Yeah, like why are the customers dropping off and why are the customers not picking our, our particular brand? Like they want more uh, of yeah. that insight, which is, can be hard mm -hmm. to get in a, in a you know, qualitative way. It is totally possible to get in a qualitative way, but you can't ask directly. What you have to do is you have to talk to people who represent your core customers and have them just walk you through their day. And you, I guarantee, will learn. They will not tell you necessarily, but you have to learn. You have to go through like, oh, what are they doing? And then you can probably, uh, if, if you're really asking, question, asking the right questions, figure out why they aren't. But you have to not be looking to be proven right, right, because that's what I was. I didn't raise my hand on that one. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm not saying you, I'm saying a lot of times, like yeah. this is why validation, Yeah. Mm, burn that word, like make that a forbidden word in your organization because all validation means is prove me right because we're launching next week, <laughs> this better be right. But totally. if, if you're trying to find out, if you're like, oh, people are dropping off or people aren't buying our product, what you do, I, I, if you like set up like a dozen conversations with people who like represent your customer, who like have the problem or buy the thing, like you can, you can like screen them for like, have you bought any of these things? You know, you're just screening. And then you pick ones who've bought one of your competitors maybe. But then you just talk to them about their lives and you'll learn, you'll learn why they're not using yours if you're willing to be honest. If you say honestly like, oh, is it cause like they're super busy or they need something else or they don't understand the language we're using? Cause the reasons they aren't could be so big, like they don't understand the value. Oh, you didn't, um, the thing you get with qualitative that you cannot get with a survey and you cannot get with analytics is what you didn't think to ask. Yeah. And that's what you need to know for something like that. You're like, because you don't know, otherwise you can't exhaustively say, uh, is it because the price is too high? Is it because like you don't understand the language? Is it because, but if you talk to somebody, you could, if you talk to enough people, you can figure that out. You could figure out like, oh, 
they have a totally different mental model of, of their problem than we have. Oh, our language is totally alienating to them. Um, oh, they're actually solving the problem, doing something totally free, right? And they, don't, they would never pay for what we're offering. I did suggest that, but my stakeholder was like, no, we need much more um, participants to see that. So, yeah. <laughs> so super quickly, I'll show you like my favorite thing. This, okay, this is the part with the traumatizing to remember things. Um, cause, uh, yeah, cause people get so obsessed about number of, uh, of participants. But the problem is, Right, there are only two types of data. There's quantitative and qualitative. If you have a quantitative question, how many, how much, et cetera, you use a quantitative method. If you have a qualitative question, you use a qualitative method. And sometimes you do mixed methods, you need both, right? You need to know what's happening and how much frequently in business, those are both important. Because if like, oh, this is definitely happening, but only three people do it, then that's irrelevant to your business. So that's the place to start. You have to say, well, do we need to know why? If we need to know why, you cannot map your way to why. If you need to know a detail, the thick data, that's why that uh, Wall Street Journal article is so good, because they talk about uh, qualitative data and the power of qualitative data to understand human behavior. The only way you can do that is qualitative. You cannot, and that's what the 4C surveys, that's the alchemy they're trying to do, is, oh, we know that managers really like numbers and are comfortable with numbers. So we're gonna do this magic where we're gonna turn feelings into math. And all of a sudden you're asking people how they feel about the number of clicks. <laughs> because the problem that's solving, and they're a very smart business, because they're like, what problem will people pay us to solve? <laughs> ah, terrified of talking to people. That's the problem, that's what they're selling. They're selling comfort of a right answer. They're selling like, oh, we're not in messy feelings. We're in quantitative certitude, <sighs> right, right. So, <laughs> so super good. So I, was, so I was writing the survey part, and I'm like, oh, I've got to answer people's questions about sample size and statistically significant sample size. And I'm like, oh, I'm getting, I'm doing math, and it's getting really dry and boring. And I thought, oh, how can I make this fun for everybody? And I thought, oh, I know, centaurs, right? Oh, my, my hideous centaurs. So I've got to fix the clicking here. And then I just, I made a slide using my little people, but I turned them into centaurs, which is truly frightening. <laughs> right? You're not gonna be able to unsee that. So in the book, this is the big selling point for the book is the way I explain statistical um, probabilistic sampling, is I say, imagine that who you're trying to reach is a, is a forest full of centaurs, because you want to sell them waste packs. Because how else do centaurs carry snacks? But in waste packs. So you have to go through this whole process, like, okay, this is our target population, all the centaurs in the forest, all the centaurs that you have the ability to uh, contact, that's your sampling frame, um, and then your actual sample is somewhere in there, right? If you're actually, because what people really do is they just want a larger number, but they don't want to actually do statistics, and if you're actually going for a representative sample, so you want to be able to draw um, quantitative conclusions with statistical, not um, qualitative confidence, uh, you got to go through this, right? You got to do that. I mean, this is a good, like, you could just take a picture of this, like, t if you want to do, like, a scared straight thing. <laughs> and be like, we could talk to people or that, right? Um, because sure, you know, if you wanna, you can get a sample to, to represent blah, 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 but you've gotta go through all of this. Because if what you're really talking about is quantitative statistical confidence, you have to be honest or else it's just anecdotes you can count, which is not the same as quantitative data. So I have, I have a, an equation and I've got some very, messed up looking centaurs, right? And then you can run into all sorts of other biases, just lousy with biases, non-response bias, right? Because the people you actually want to reach didn't answer, the, didn't respond to the survey. Or 
you know, some people weren't represented, or your sample overrepresents people with strong opinions, right? You only get people who love you or hate you, right? There's all this bias that creeps in. Just because you're just because you surveyed a thousand people doesn't mean that you have statistical confidence, and it doesn't mean that you can draw conclusions that are more valid than you could from talking to twelve people. It all depends on what your question is, and the best way to answer that question, and what type of confidence you're going for. Yeah. Yeah, I have a statement and a uh, question. Uh, one, the click uh, survey. How many clicks? The UX designer in me says someone could misread that and then say, oh, how many clicks? Oh, I had to go through four clicks. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, the question is, uh, there's so many, uh, there's at least two co companies out there making self-driving taxis, autonomous taxis. How do you make sure that's a proper product that people will use? No one's, uh, uh, I mean, people, tr do they trust it? Do they not? Mm -hmm. Do they want it? Is, is the, do the economics work out? Uh, I mean, what questions do you ask and what do you do about new products like that? Uh, the number one question for something like that is what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> and we know that. Okay, there are two bad things that could happen. Well, there are several bad things that can happen with um, self-driving taxis. Uh, this is this is a super hobby horse of mine, and, and I don't have you know a lot of time. I could again, I could talk about this for nine hours because I think it's such a garbage solution to the actual problem, which is affordable transportation that doesn't destroy the planet. Instead, we're like, how can we keep selling cars? Um, no, my thought experiment for self-driving taxis is like, imagine you actually have an autonomous car, right? And it's like it's it's zipping along the road. Have you seen what people do to scooters? Autonomous taxi hunting is going to be the best sport of the 21st century. People will absolutely capture those things and destroy them if there aren't humans in them. And you're laughing, but it's totally going to happen. We're in Paul Verhoeven's universe now, man. Um, yeah, so, the, so what you do, the first question to ask that people are not asking with that is what problem are we solving? The problem right now that autonomous, autonomous taxis are solving is what lie can we tell so people buy our stock? That is honestly the problem those things are solving. Like I think autonomous uh, trucks or semi-autonomous trucks, like convoys of trucks, but I mean you could have it, it, it's basically a train, so why don't we just have a train? <laughs> like trains, right? It's, it's ridiculous, it's ridiculous the, what's going on with uh, autonomous cars, because that's a really hard problem to solve. Plus, why are they putting the intelligence in the car instead of in the road, right? If the road knew, because the thing I'm trying to find, because I, I, I love Disneyland, right? I grew up in LA, I really love Disneyland. Um, a much better way to solve the problem is instead of having a fully autonomous car, like there's actually tape that they can put down, and I don't remember this, I had a friend who was a, an Imagineer, and described prototyping the Indiana Jones ride, where they put like this tape down, and the, there was a sensor in the car that followed the tape. So what if you essentially had something like that with a track, where the cars weren't autonomous, they were essentially like on a track. It was like a ride design system, where they couldn't just go willy-nilly and murder people, because it was designed like a ride system. That would be a much easier engineering problem, and wouldn't murder people. But the model they have is, oh, how do we take the passenger car and make it fully autonomous, which is so hard, so dumb, and so dangerous. And it can be stolen. Yeah, and, and people can just mess with them, right? Especially if like income inequality is going, how it's going. Yeah, people are absolutely gonna like steal those things and ransom them, and yeah, people don't think enough about um, dark pattern behavior, like dark journey maps and stuff like that. I think that's really, that's a whole category of questions, but yeah. Yeah. For redesign and new product launch, research is somewhat straightforward, even though it's not. But what do you do for a new paradigm? Um, oh yeah, like, oh, this has never existed before. Like the internet. Like, the, like, like how do you research the internet? Right. Well, if you, really, you if you really are doing, um, 
But the internet wasn't designed as a, I mean, they had a problem, and the problem was like, what if we all get nuked? I mean, that's the internet. Um, but how do you, how do you, are you just saying like, how do you research something that's just totally new? I mean, it's the same way. It's like, what's our goal? Uh, the internet had it, the internet didn't have a commercial goal when it started, so. It had a goal of like, what happens if one town gets nuked and they just will pass information around. That was like the internet. Um, but what I'll say is like, is people overestimate sort of the blue skyness of things because my favorite thought experiment for that is get on Google Maps, Google Earth, which is I really think one of the most life-changing innovations, right, that they created by putting cameras on cars and driving around the whole planet. That wasn't a very, uh, <coughs> I mean, it, it took some technology to get the data and stitch it all together, and they took a lot of data and stuff like that. Not to denigrate that, but they really, the way they got that was by putting cameras on cars and driving them on every road on the planet. Um, look, if you look at the town you grew up in, right, and see how futury does it look, and look at how much didn't change. Whatever blue sky innovation you make that's like a total paradigm shift, has to fit into that world. And that world is mostly unchanged. And so that's the question to ask, is like, if you want something to be adopted, is how does this fit into what already exists? Because you look at this room, right, 2019, but this room has probably looked like this, maybe some new chair upholstery for 30 years. What park is that? I've seen the first ethernet in the wall there, right? Um, if I look, like, and I'm from LA, so it's Blade Runner time now, right? November 2019 when Blade Runner, the first Blade Runner takes place, it looks exactly the same as when I grew up there like 30 years ago. And so any technology has to fit in that world and people totally underestimate the lag. And I think that's, that's where a lot of mistakes get made, right? The iPhone, amazing innovation because it fits into people's pockets, right? The Segway, which is like the, my example that I opened the book with, was supposed to change the world, but it didn't fit into the world. Right? It was expensive. Um, nobody knew like where to park it. It didn't, wasn't really a great transportation solution in the rain. So how could it change the world when it would, didn't fit into the world? Nothing changes the world unless it fits. And so you have to understand, especially for things that are big ambitious changes, you have to figure out, well, how's it gonna fit with existing systems? With the least amount of effort, because people are lazy, forgetful creatures of habit. Like that's what you can bet on with people. Okay, one more question. One last question. Yeah. This isn't completely related to what we just talked about. I mean, we've been all over the place, so it's fine, yeah. But what are some tips and tricks to make sure that research doesn't just go and die in Google Drive? <laughs> Number one, do not define the output of research as a document. Define, yeah, this is, this is, because uh, it's good, you, it's good to have documents, because again, forgetful, don't, People can't remember things. That's what we have Google for. Google remembers things for us. But if you say, well, when you start research, you start with what decisions do we want this research to influence? And when you plan the research, you plan with that in mind. Because that's your success criterion for the research. But how do you make sure that that information doesn't just get lost with the product team or the project mm -hmm. team? You look at uh, what's already successful for the retention and transmission of information in your organization. You don't put research in a separate channel. That's the mistake people make. They're like, there's how we communicate and remember things, and then research, which is like, okay, when you're done with your work, here's some kale. <laughs> so do whatever you can to make it memorable, right? Um, I, I've seen so many really, really boring research presentations and research reports as though being boring somehow makes the research better. It, it does not. It, it does not invalidate the research, like to tell a good story. People remember stories, but you have to start with what's meaningful to them. It goes back to like, your innovations fit into the world, then they will have an impact. It's the same thing. If the new data hooks into people's existing beliefs, they'll retain it. But in order to do that, you have to understand people's existing beliefs. This is why starting with internal research, stakeholder research, understanding what's important to you, the business decision maker, 
And then you go to them and you're like, hey, I learned some things that are gonna make you rich. They'll remember that. Or you could traumatize them a little bit, but that's like, keep that in your back pocket. <laughs> back pocket. Because what I tell people, I say, you know, um, if you go through a big front end redesign and don't fix your, work, your internal workflows and don't fix your internal communication channels, right? It's like a face transplant when you don't hook up the, the nerve endings and the blood vessels. The face will die and slide off the skull. You will all remember that now, <laughs> right? You'll be like, oh yeah, if we're doing a big public facing redesign or a big new product launch, we have to make sure that we also redesign the workflows or dead face on skull. <laughs> Mnemonic, right? Don't, but, but use that sparingly. More humor, <laughs> more supporting. Every once in a while, a little bit of trauma, people will remember it, but don't, don't overload it. But yeah, but it really is, like, don't think of like research, I gotta make you eat your vegetables. Gotta make you eat kale. Like, kale's fine sometimes with a lot of butter on it, but kale chips are an abomination. Um, but that's how you do it. You fit it in, you go like, what already works? Like this, what already works and why does it work are two really important design and research questions. And the same thing goes for communicating new information. What do people talk about? What do people remember? Hook it onto that, because you're trying to make things stick in people's heads. What stories are we already telling about how we work together, about what makes us successful? What are our brand values? Whatever. Tell a good story. Like Walt Disney did so much propaganda. Like, like Walt Disney and German rocket scientists got us to the moon. This is true. This and carrots. These will be the, th the things you take away. Carrots are orange because of the Dutch. And Werner von Braun got us to the moon with the help of Walt Disney. Absolutely true. Walt Disney did propaganda to get America to the moon. So you're kind of you kind of have to have your own little propaganda operation to figure out how to tell a story, because um, as I won't go into world events, but um, but people hook on to falsehoods. Like like Mark Twain wrote about this, right? Like. Like a lie goes around the world while the truth is still putting on its boots or something fanciful like that. Um, but you're in competition with what's comfortable for people. And so you gotta make it comfortable and make it fun and make it like, yay, we learned some stuff. You know, and that doesn't invalidate the research. Thank you. So I guess we are done for today. Thank you for entertaining questions and Erica for sharing everything. Thanks,